Hey guys, thanks for tuning us in for this 36th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Toll. Special guests for this episode include Ulysses Villamine and brother Eli Soriano from the Unheard Truth podcast. Dinesh D'Souza will be talking about his new documentary, Trump Card. Writer and director Richard Bergen will be talking about his psychological horror film, Fang. And horror film legend Bill Mosley, he'll be talking about what October means to him each year, plus his latest works. If you would, please take the time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and share with your friends. All right, guys, I would love having extra special guests and uh, actually was uh, come across a podcast uh, last week, I believe it was, that uh, Ulysses and I uh, caught up and I said, hey, we would love to have uh, a join over on the podcast and uh, and Ulysses and a special guest with us today. And Ulysses, I'm going to let you do the uh, do the big introduction, if you will. Hi, Cameron. How are you doing great today? Thank you for inviting us here on your show. Um, I'm here with, uh, first of all, my name is Ulysses Villamin, and I'm the host for the Unheard Truth podcast. It's a religious podcast, and we just uh, launched last August 23. So it's around like two months, more or less. And I have with me my Bible resource person, if you will, on the show. Uh, he's a well-known preacher in the Philippines, and he's known for his um, straightforward preaching. He is called, he is known to be uh, a hard-hitting preacher because his, his mantra or his, his vision is to expose uh, anomalies in the religious world. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you the overall servant of the Members Church of God International, Brother Eli Soriano. Good, good day, uh, Cameron. It's our pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I do not know what will be the subject of this interview, Brother <laughs> Yuli. But uh, it will be a pleasure for me to knowing you and meeting you even by uh, radio or by uh, this podcast. <laughs> well, well, brother, first off, I, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the, the unheard truth and, and where the ministry and uh, where your ministry actually uh, got underway, if you will. Uh, the ministry is uh, in the Church of God International. Cameron, and uh, it started some some time in nineteen hundred and sixty nine. I started preaching the gospel when I was about eighteen or nineteen or twenty years old. It's the start of that ministry. Mm -hmm. And we used the airlines as early as the 19, early 1980. To be exact, that was November of 1980 when I first broadcast the preachings that I'm doing in a radio station in the Philippines. And up to now, it is now known as the longest running religious program in television, in radio, and internet in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. That is our background for you to know, uh, Cameron. And wh where, what do you think it is that differentiates the teachings that, uh, that, that you bring forth over maybe some that, uh, that, uh, are, are considered religious, but maybe not necessarily following uh, the, the, the same belief system, if you will. There is a great difference. Of course, there is a great difference in my in my own analysis and opinion. Mm -hmm. And this this difference, we are broadcasting in our podcast with Mister Billiamin. 
we called it uh, the unheard truth uh, from the Bible. When we say unheard truth, it dispels the difference because there are religious groups that are preaching 2,000 years ago, like the Catholics, teaching people, billions of them in the planet, the Protestantis, Protestantism also does the same in the sense that it is already existing for 500 years when a Catholic priest revolted or disagreed with the teachings of uh, the Pope in Rome in the person of um, Martin Luther. And Jehovah's Witnesses are around for, a, for about 200 years, also like the Seventh-day Adventist and many more religious groups from, that is sprouted from the United States of America. All of these uh, groups are now teaching for almost 2,000 years, 500 years, 200 years, more than 200 years. And there are truths in the Bible that they, they do not preach. Sometimes they preach the same because, in my opinion, uh, nobody will will correct them, nobody will dare to, to speak against them and expose because they have the same uh, teaching, like the asking, continuous asking of 10% from people, which they call tithes, paying of tithes, which I believe is not a, a part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But almost all religions now are collecting tithes from the people, especially uh, those who are propagating or masquerading under the, the term prosperity gospel, which really wants to ec extract as much money as possible from people and giving people their false hope that when they do uh, the tithing, they, when they uh, contribute their first fruits, whatever contribution they may, may call it, they promise the people prosperity. But the people remains poor. Members are poor. Only the pastors and the preachers are, <laughs> are getting rich, prospering. That is one of our main reasons of launching this uh, podcast to, to reach for as much people as possible with the message of the gospel of Christ that religion is not a profit-making institution that the Lord Jesus Christ established on earth. It is an institution of love, mercy, and hope, an institution of good works from Christians, even to non-Christians. That is our, our main goal in doing this podcast, The Unheard Truth. And people may judge of our good interest in launching this uh, podcast and also in evangelizing in almost eight or seven continents of the world because we are being cover covered by, uh, I do not know now how much, but l later, uh, no, in the past, uh, we are being served by seven satellite providers covering entirely the whole globe. Our, our faith is being broadcast in television, in radio, via satellite, reaching even the, the remote areas of oceans and seas all over the globe. We have followers even in cruises, uh, that follows our program. 
I think and, it's, uh, it is the it has given you an idea of our intention and our goal to reach out for as much people as possible. And, and to get the response back that you guys have for the podcast, and uh, obviously that uh, that is an opportunity showing the people that you've been able to reach. And what does that mean to you on uh, on not only the uh, the professional, the, the spiritual side, but on, on a personal side? Uh, how, how rewarding is that? You see, Cameron, for me, I have the feeling of... Console, consolation, fulfillment, when people uh, calls, ask questions, and then afterwards, you see them with tears, understanding uh, verses of the Bible for whom they have had uh, difficulty understanding for such a long time in their past religions. Uh, it gives, gives me comfort of heart, knowing that this is not a work that we are doing alone. Because according to 1614 of the book of Acts, it is the Lord that opens the heart and the minds of people to understand these words. That's why um, we are happy doing this, although it sometimes entails a big amount of money for uh, propagating the gospel and persecutions, defamations, etc. All lies that are thrown against us in propagating the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this, all we, all of this, we take as uh, our our joy, knowing that what the Lord Jesus Christ have preached two thousand years ago is happening to us in 511 of the book of Matthew when he said that uh, blessed are you when people shall revile you and uh, persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. I do not know anyone Russian but even in Russia, there are people who are against me, publishing in the internet, uh, defamations, etc. They even call me a fugitive from justice, but I am free preaching in South America and Central America, going to places, preaching the word of God that were, that were not preached by I should say almost all religious groups in our times. So it's our pleasure, it's our advocacy, it's our dream to reach as much people as possible. And that is one of the reasons why we have launched this forecast. And we are glad that after almost, uh, only after almost two months, we have more than less than 1.5 million downloads meaning that people really are interested in things that we are talking or we are say we are preaching. And, and brother, we also want to make sure and, and I want to let our listeners know where they can find the podcast and, and more information about, uh, about the ministry that you have as well. Yeah, I will be answering that for you, uh, Cameron. They can check out our podcast in www.theunheardtruthpodcast.com. It's www theunheardtruthpodcast.com and they can learn more about our congregation at www.mcgi.org it's www.mcgi.org they can visit that website and know more about uh, Brother Ellie's 24-7 preaching activities all right. Well, uh, Ulysses, I, I truly appreciate uh, you and the brothers' uh, time to be on the podcast today. Uh, it's been great to get to visit with you guys. Uh, hopefully, we can catch up again real soon and continued blessings on your ministry. I, I hope so, Cameron. And I want to, especially I want before I go, uh, to, to invite the attention and the curiosity of everyone. I would say that most religions now 
are founded in the interest of money, greed, power, and fame, contrary to what the Bible teaches. Thank you, Hamran. All right, our next guest here on the podcast is, uh, well, Dinesh D'Souza. First off, uh, we, we all know him for, for, for so many things. We've uh, we talked about his uh, his latest book, also about the new documentary that was coming out, uh, but uh, it is now out and available for consumption. And uh, first off, Mr. D'Souza, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's good to be on the show. Now, now, now first off, uh, Dinesh, uh, tell us a little bit about Trump card, and uh, obviously, we don't want to give away the the, the Big Bang uh, all all at once. But uh, man alive, this is a, this is a, a timely release for you as well. Yes, uh, Trump card is is out, and it's not in the theater. Unlike my earlier movies, it's available on demand. So, Trump card the movie dot com is the place to go to find out how to get it. It's available on a whole bunch of platforms. Now, the movie is based upon my book, United States of Socialism, uh, and I think that's the destination that the Democratic left is trying to take us. So the movie shows how this crazy idea of socialism that has collapsed all over the world, the most discredited idea since slavery, how this idea has made a kind of weird comeback in America in the 21st century. It looks at who's behind all this, why it's evil, and how we can stop it. And, and Dinesh, this is also is a, you come, this comes from personal experience for you as well. Yeah, you know, the left today says we don't want authoritarian socialism like Stalin or Lenin. We want democratic socialism. But I grew up under democratic socialism, India, in the 1970s. Uh, and I remember socialism defined by our family having a ration card, which set limits on how much rice and sugar and cooking oil my mom could buy. We were on a seven-year waiting list to get a phone. So to me, socialism is symbolized by scarcity, by misery. India at that time was the begging bowl of the world. And India only began to start doing better when it moved away from socialism. And uh, the, the, the new age so, so socialism, if you will, what, what makes it different? Or, or is there really any major difference from that you experienced in the 70s? There is a couple there are a couple of major differences. One is that the new socialism I call it identity socialism because it's a marriage of socialism and identity politics. Remember that Marx divided society into the rich and the poor. Uh, Marx was a divider, but only on the economic basis. But what the left does today is they divide society in many ways, rich against poor, but also black against white, male against female, straight against gay, legal against illegal. So the left today is more divisive than Marx. And, and the reason they're doing this is they're trying to assemble a majority coalition of oppressed victim groups. And how much do you think that uh, the COVID-19 and coronavirus pandemic has kind of played into maybe the fear mentality? Well, coronavirus offered the left a political opportunity, much in the same way that the Great Depression did in the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt realized that he could push through tax rates and confiscatory policies that would never have gone through otherwise. The politics of fear is very useful to the left. So coronavirus is real. There's a real virus. But it's also being used by the left to habituate people to staying at home. This is why they want to go into semi-permanent lockdown. They want to be able to create this dependency where you get $2,000 a month and then you vote for the Democrats every single time. Uh, they've also been using it to suppress civil liberties, uh, the right to uh, worship, for example, or even the right to assemble. These constitutional rights otherwise inviolable. They're not even up for democratic referendum, but they are being suppressed in the age of coronavirus, particularly in democratic run cities and states. And what do you think about uh, the, the polling that's taking place? Is this media driven, do you think, or do you think the numbers are actually as the polls are, are shown, or do you think those are, are, are rigged in some sort of way? Well, I think that the poll numbers are weighted in order to oversample Democrats um, and the pollster class is pretty much the same as the media class. It's hard to argue anymore that these people don't have an agenda. They do. And the reason they release one poll after the other is to demoralize the Trump constituency, make it feel like, like the election is a done deal. 
even though it very much isn't. Um, I live in a very conservative part of Texas. The Republican gets a large portion of the vote. Uh, but we, I don't see very many Trump signs or Trump hats. And I think it's because people don't want to be hassled. They don't want someone yelling at them at the grocery store or the bank. And so the left has created also this atmosphere of cultural intimidation in which the people who support Trump and the Republicans are a little more muted, but they won't be muted on Election Day. And you talked about how people don't want to be berated. And how do you think uh, how do you think this last year in in all of this has affected our ability for free speech uh, above and beyond what just what people want to hear? Free speech is under more serious threat than at any time in my adult lifetime. Um, when you look at the combination of digital censorship, corporate censorship, people being fired for saying the wrong thing or even posting something um, outside of their business uh, on a personal website, uh, if you look at the intolerance in academia, the intolerance in Hollywood, it literally drive you out if you don't conform to their ideology. This is a very perilous time for free speech in America, and groups that at one time were set up to defend free speech like the ACLU are nowhere to be seen. In fact, they are part of the problem. And do you use what? What do you see as a, that? That is a possibility of of making a change in 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 any way as far as that's regarded. I think ultimately the best way is to first of all uh, bring these digital platforms uh, into into line, and the way you do that is by uh, holding them legally liable for whatever is said on the platform. Now they basically say you can't do that. We're like the phone company. You can't sue the phone company for what someone says over the phone. Well, the problem is that these digital companies are more like the Atlantic Monthly uh, or the New York Times than they are like the phone company because they regulate content. They're constantly kicking people off uh, Twitter or Facebook. They're constantly saying, "Uh, I'm going to amplify these tweets and I'm going to restrict those. So this is not phone company behavior. This is basically editorial behavior for which these people should be fully liable. And in in the movie, the the documentary Trump Card, uh, we'll go back to that as well. Uh, some of the examples of how socialism uh, has failed elsewhere uh, are are they maybe the ones that, uh, that 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 are not brought to the forefront by the the regular media, if you will. Well, the left tries to escape the horrific record of socialism. I mean, just not only a record of famine and starvation, but also of a hundred million casualties. They try to get around all that by saying, well, we're following the Scandinavian model. We, we don't want to be like China or even Venezuela. Uh, we want to be like um, Stockholm or, or uh, Norway. Uh, but the truth of it is they're not following the Scandinavian model. The Scandinavians are capitalist in wealth creation, even if they are socialist in wealth distribution. The cap- in, in, in Scandinavia, they don't demonize the rich. Their tax rates, their corporate tax rates are about the same as ours. They have no minimum wage. With the exception of one country, they have no wealth tax. They have no inheritance tax. So all of this uh, demonization of the rich, um, the railing against billionaires and millionaires, this robbing Peter to pay Paul in the hope that you'll get Paul's vote, none of this nonsense goes on in Scandinavia. There you go. And again, uh, Dinesh, I want to make sure and, and let our listeners know where to uh, where to find the not only the book, but also the uh, the documentary and everything else that you've been working on as well. The book is the United States of Socialism. It's available everywhere. Books are sold. Uh, the movie uh, is available on Apple iTunes and Google and YouTube and Vudu and Fandango, the movie site. You can buy a physical DV at Walmart.com or Target.com. So go to TrumpCardTheMovie.com. It'll show you all the different places you can get the physical DVD or that you can download the movie and watch it on any device from your phone to your computer to your big screen TV. All right. Well, Dinesh D'Souza, it is always great to visit with you. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule and hope you have a great rest of your week, my friend. Hey, thank you. All right, guys, our next guest on today's podcast is uh, the writer and director of the psychological horror film Fang, Richard Bergen on the line with us. And uh, first off, Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. Oh, you're very welcome, Cameron. Thank you for having me on. Now, now, Richard, tell us a, a little bit about Fang. Where, do, where did uh, you first get the inspiration, if you will, for for the new film? Well, Fang is the story of a young man named Billy Cochran, 
He is a janitor who lives with his mother in kind of this pretty neighborhood in Chicago. And Billy has undiagnosed autism. So, you know, he's very isolated. He's very disconnected from the people around him. And so one night, Billy wakes up. You know, he has to go to the bathroom. And then he finds this rat in the bathtub. And the rat jumps out and bites him. And I, I can't say any, I can't say too much more. But then from that point forward, Billy starts to feel like he's transforming into a giant rat himself. So that's kind of, that's that's the main premise of the movie. And a lot of it was inspired by different life experiences that I've had. You know, I think the, I don't, I don't remember exactly where I got the idea to have the protagonist Billy turn into a rat, but it's definitely kind of that feeling you get, you know, if you're disabled or you're sick or ill in any capacity, you could start to feel kind of like you're a rat in a cave, you know, you're, you're kind of cast out from society and then people look at you as a pest because you're, you're disabled and you can't fully participate in the world. So I think that's kind of where the rat idea came from. And, and for you, did when did uh, writing, directing, when did you get first inspired that uh, that that is something you wanted to uh, you wanted to to work forward to? No, I think well, I've always been a storyteller ever since I was a little kid, and I think that you know my decision to become a filmmaker was just because I see you know movies and more recently you know which is like running TV shows, it's like film is a total art form, you know, it combines everything else. Like in movies, you know, you have writing, acting, photography, music, you know, animation sometimes, and, you know, it just kind of combines every other art form into one. So I think that is why I ultimately decided to become a filmmaker. Now, did uh, does does music inspire? I, I know a lot of times, you know, the 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 music in a film is is just as important sometimes as as the plot oh, line true, in different yeah. timing. So, do you find inspiration in like just in everyday life? You're you're hearing music and and uh, it, it it trips uh it, it trips uh, an alarm or something. Maybe an inspiration uh, sparks from a, a certain type of a music for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean when I'm when I'm writing, you know, when I'm working on a uh, screenplay, either for Fang or for anything else, you know, I, I usually have to listen to music that matches what I'm writing so I can create the right mood because, you know, it's hard for me. You know, because when I'm writing, I have to really get into zone to visualize everything that's happening so I can, I can write it down. And then the music really helps me with that because then, you know, if I try to visualize it, try to get myself into the headspace of the movie, and then I hear music that is very fitting for the scene I'm doing, then that that is a great help and source of inspiration for me. And talk about the uh, the, the the challenges that you faced uh, getting getting into the entertainment industry in the first place, and you you talked about feeling like a rat kind of caged up or or maybe an outsider. How hard has it been to kind of get your foot in the door? Even well, getting your foot in the door is the easy part. Getting all the way through the door is the hard part, but. No, you yeah, know, it was it was fairly easy to get people on board with the making of Fang because I wrote the script for Fang so it could be filmed on as low a budget as possible. And that's really the advice I would give to anybody who wants to make movies is, you know, do it cheap because, you know, people are not going to be giving you hundreds of millions of dollars for your first movie when you've never really made a feature film before. So so I, so I made Fang very cheap and it was easy to get people on board to make it because I sent the script, you know, to different people and then most everybody really liked the script. But I would say the biggest challenge is just the sheer magnitude of making a feature film, you know. It's like you sit down to watch it and it's like, oh yeah, 90 minutes, 100 minutes, two hours, you know. Oh yeah, I can do that. But then actually making it, you know, it takes years and just day after day, like, 
was coming over a period of 23 days, which isn't even that much, but it was like 23, 12-hour days in a row with, with very few days off in between. So I think just the sheer magnitude of making a project like this is probably the biggest challenge. It's like everything is on a bigger scale than you anticipate. And this movie was still on a relatively small scale compared to like the really big, long, elaborate movies. So is is the horror genre is that uh, is, is that kind of the genre you're aiming to be a part of, or is that maybe just the inspiration on this film? Well, I do I do plan on you know branching out more doing. You know, I, I want to show that I, I'm a really versatile writer and director that I can do a lot of different things. But I think for me, the horror really comes from the characters and their relationship and kind of what they go through you know, in their lives rather than following any horror conventions per se. Because I think, if anything, Fang starts out, you could say that it starts out as kind of like a slice of life drama where we're just following these characters in their day-to-day lives. And it goes from slice of life to slice of life. (laughs) (laughs) Slice for life. Absolutely. <laughs> now, now for you, do you are you able to when you dissect the movie? Are you are you able to find uh, the humor that that you're looking for? And, and and how hard is it to get to a point where you're finally like, okay, I'm done editing? How where, how hard is that for you to get to that point? Well, it, it took I think over half a year to get to that point. So we definitely went through a lot of edits. And we're still not done editing, but we do have picture lock now, meaning that the footage is in place, and we're not going to make any alterations to the order and placement of the footage, but we are going to, we still have to do color grading and mastering the audio and stuff like that, but that's really the final stage of editing. So it's definitely... Yeah, it's very easy to get perfectionistic and let it go on and on, you know, for a long time. And uh, now, if folks want to find out uh, more information about uh, about Fang and, and also everything else you've got going on, Richard, where's where's the best way folks can find information? Well, the best place to go right now to find out more about Fang is the Fang Facebook page, which is Fang colon the movie, and that is a really great resource, you know, that we we have like a lot of pictures from the making of the movie, a lot of people talking about their experiences working on things. So that is a really great, you know, place to go to find out more. And I plan on getting a website soon, but I have so many different projects going on at once lately that it's been kind of on the back burner, but I'll have that up and running in the very near future. All right. Well, Richard, it has been great to visit with you today. And uh, again, looking forward to the new movie, Fang. Again, follow him on Facebook. And uh, Richard, best of success to you as the, as you finalize the film. And uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Uh, that sounds great, Cameron. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Our final guest of this episode is horror film legend Bill Mosley. We talk about what October really means to him. First off, Bill, always good to visit with you. Well, thank you. And as Chop Top would say, dog will hunt. <laughs> and in October this year around, Bill, uh, what what's the feeling leading up to Halloween? I, I mean, we, it seems like we've had a spooky year already. It's been pretty spooky. Um, I'm here in Los Angeles, and uh, mercifully, it's overcast and kind of cool today. Uh, you know, it's been a weird October because uh, temperatures have been getting up to 100 degrees here. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, there have been fires to the north and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, today is the first day where it really feels like October. You know, overcast and cool and kind of spooky and, you know, just my kind of weather. And uh, as as we get into October, obviously, there's uh, the ha- Halloween holiday. And, uh, well, Bill, your, your, your face is going to be seen on, on the screens a little this month, right? Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses, is on Netflix. And I think uh, Rob Zombie's Three from Hell is on uh, Shudder. Uh, and of course, uh, everybody likes to rent uh, 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 as kind of an annual Halloween uh, movie. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well represented. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bill, this, this year, like we talked, being so spooky, obviously a lot of filming has, has had to take uh, a back seat. But I know the, doing music, has, has that given you uh, maybe a little bit more time to, to work on the musical side? I know that uh, you got that love in your heart as well. Um, absolutely. I, I actually haven't been doing a lot of music only because, uh, you know, we've been, uh, you know, kind of locked down and, uh, you know, not a lot of, uh, you know, movement between people, but, um, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Bill and Phil songs of darkness and despair is available at, that's at, uh, EP I did with uh, Phil Anselmo a couple of years ago. And then of course, uh, my music, uh, corn bugs with, uh, the world's greatest guitar player, Buckethead. So it's out there. It's on, it's on iTunes, but uh, all I've been doing is singing in the shower. <laughs> That's, that, that, that can be horrific uh, in, in some lights, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, now, Bill, this uh, the, the, because of what twenty twenty has been has uh, has October been kind of uh, where where you've been looking forward to uh, to to kind of get this all behind you a little bit. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still waiting to turn that corner. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, in fact, this afternoon I have another COVID test uh, coming up because. Um, I, I did a uh, music video a couple of days ago and, um, you know, just to, uh, you know, make my, uh, uh, wife and daughter a little more comfortable. You know, I always like to, uh, if ever I go to a gathering, you know, where some people aren't wearing masks, et cetera, you know, I do like to get the, uh, the test just in case. And a couple of weeks ago, actually, I was actually in Phoenix, Arizona doing, uh, uh, my first horror convention since the, uh, since the COVID and, uh, that was called mad monster party. And it was really <laughs> kind of cool to see the, the future of, uh, horror conventions where now, uh, the tables are double thick to keep the fans uh, six feet apart and everybody's got masks. And of course, uh, you know, when they come into the convention, they get checked for their temperature and all that stuff. So, but the show went on, and uh, you know it was a lot of fun. Actually, I I, I miss the horror cons. And, and for you, Bill, which uh, which character being recognized uh, is the coolest for you to see from the fans? You know, it really is a toss up between Chop Top and uh, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Two and Otis Driftwood from the Rob Zombie House of a Thousand Corpses trilogy. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the younger fans, you know, seem to be, uh, more Otis fans and, uh, the older fans seem to be more chop top fans, but it's pretty much, uh, even Steven, um, you know, and I, I love them both. You know, I, I especially, you know, when it comes right down to it, I, I really, uh, revere chop top the most because if it weren't for chop top, I wouldn't be Otis Driftwood. That's right. Now, uh, for, for you, the uh, as October finishes and uh, has has filming opportunities have have those started to come back around for you, Bill? Uh, not so much for me this year. I mean, I have I have a couple of gigs, but they are happening in in twenty twenty one. So I, I think that still people. I think filming, you know, it has resumed, and um, uh, you know, for some people, uh, for the for the the, the projects I'm attached to, um, I think they're, they're kicking the can up to uh, 2021. I did do last year before, uh, before the end of last year, November, December, I was in Japan uh, working on a movie called Prisoners of the Ghostland and uh, directed by a Japanese director named Sion Sono, S-O-N-O, and starring Nick Cage. Uh, who was just a hoot and a you know a pleasure to work with? What a great guy and a great actor, and uh, it's a crazy fantasy, uh, and uh, it'll be out one of these days. Again, COVID has kind of delayed everything, including post production. And uh, but uh, if you get a chance when it comes out, Prisoners of the Ghostland with Nick Cage uh, is going to really be a great great entertainment. And of course, Bill, if, if folks want to find out more information about all of your other works, uh, obviously they can follow you social media and, and website as well. Uh, yes, the social media is at 
Chop Top Mosley, C-H-O-P-T-O-P-M-O-S-E-L-E-Y. And uh, that's Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. And then um, uh, my website is Chop Tops Barbecue or BBQ. So C-H-O-P-T-O-P-S-B-B-Q dot com. All right. Well, Bill, always great to visit with you, sir. I hope you enjoy the rest of October, and uh, we look forward to visiting again with you next year. Well, that sounds great. Thanks again for joining us for this 36th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, feel free to click the support tab and follow the instructions. If you have a special guest idea, feel free to email me, Cameron, at kwhw.com. We'll be back with episode 37 coming up tomorrow.